So I'm now going to um, dive into this topic of, of hybrid modeling techniques. And I, I'm going to use it to kind of synthesize some characteristics um, regarding hybrid modeling in general, including HMS modeling, to, to reinforce what we've seen and to, to help emphasize the commonality between these approaches, but to bring out, you know, central features of what we've been discussing um, thus far. So within the opening hour of this boot camp, or at least of its substantive sessions on non-administrative sessions, we discuss the role that dynamic models play. Right. Um, they 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 serve as these vehicles for capturing theory, often theory hypothesized to apply in the world. Sometimes theory that's just um, put forward as a as a thought piece um, to see its consequences, uh, but they allow us with that theory to ask what are the questions. And we're going to be seeing three different traditions within this morning of putting forward theory in models. And these traditions are each rich, each powerful, each widespread, each insightful, but within quite different spheres or they play to quite different strengths. But they all share certain characteristics. So all of them will depict some system's evolution over time. And for all of them, in general, the system will be such, described in such a way, typically, most generally non-linear, that you cannot just ahead of time write down what the system will do. In general, with non-linear equations, we don't have a way of solving them in what is known mathematically as closed form. We can't just write down a formula for what they're going to do. We solve them by iterating and iterating here over time. And in order to do this, we simulate how the situation depicted by the model changes over time, how it evolves, how that situation goes bit by bit by bit by bit uh, forward in time. We have a sort of depiction of this external world, a kind of micro world depiction that mimics some aspects of the world, and it plays out in the model in ways similar to what it would play out in the world. And we've seen that in nature-based models. We've seen these agents start smoking and quit smoking, right? We've seen them develop heart disease. We've seen them pass away, right? Um, now, all of these traditions, it's important to know, all of the traditions, system dynamics or compartmental modeling, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, they fundamentally work by giving us a language for specifying how, given the current situation, it's going to change over the next little bit. The language for doing that is quite different. The language of flows and system dynamics. The language is of transitions and state charts with rules and rules for the delays and queuing associated with discrete events and, and the need for resources, et cetera. But what results from this, if you specify how it's gonna change in the next little bit, contingent on its current situation, availability of resources and resource pools and, and um, discrete event simulation, for example, what happens is the behavior of the system as a whole is emergent. So you specify how it would change in the next little bit based on its current situation. 
and you you run it forward. Um, and generally, these models will be nonlinear. Now, this is in contrast to models where ahead of time we can just write down what the solution is. You know that there's some deterministic behavior, regardless of any sort of state that just plays out in some fixed way over time. Maybe maybe linearly here. It's also different than like stochastics with no dependence on the current situation where it's independent, you know, independently drawn um, uh, over, over time from some distribution, right? ID. Identically distributed and independent distributed. Instead, what we have in general is this coupled nonlinear dynamical system. Things are tangled, right? And I, I argued from this podium that we're trying to characterize some depiction in the model of some underlying situation and data from the model is of interest, but it reflects kind of shadows cast um, out, of, out of this underlying situation. And those shadows share these whispers of the underlying situation. And uh, yesterday I, I gave a nod to the importance of nonlinearity. Um, this is really quite keen. I'm not gonna emphasize it. Uh, a lot here, but it gives rise to counterintuitive behavior. It gives rise to surprising, um, not just weak emergence, but sometimes strong emergence to effects like history dependence, where what went on earlier shapes in a big way, what happens later, two things that start very close together can diverge. Um, and, and we see this all the time in real world systems. We see early life adversity leading to later life consequences, right? Later life health burdens for chronic diseases coming about because of your childhood conditions or your experience of trauma early on. There can be tipping points where the system ends up in very different situations and that are that may be stable or, or cyclic. And there can be lock-in effects where it's a lot harder to get it out of one of those situations than it would have been to prevent it from getting there in the first place. And again, our experience in the health sciences shows these sort of phenomena, you know, uh, very on a very widespread basis. And sometimes there's this disproportionate impact of heterogeneity where certain groups have this um, disproportionate impact on the system evolution. Maybe it's groups who have very high levels of contacts sexually and keep a sexually transmitted infection circulating in a, in a community where based on average behavior across the community, you'd expect it to die out. Um, so um, in all of these cases, across all traditions, there's um, not only a depiction of state over time and, and asking how does the next little bit depend on the current state? There's this distinction between uh, three types of quantities, endogenous quantities. These are the quantities the model produces over time. It generates them generally as, as emergent properties. Secondly, quantities that are told to the model, which has pre-specified assumptions. They could be, they could be con assumptions of constant values that are invariant over time, or it could just be pre-specified in some way that might change over time, but it's not generated by the model. The first, the, the first type of quantity, the model tells us, it generates it. So maybe you'll tell me, let's make this a little bit interactive. So we're gonna go back to, to this model we built, this crowding disparities model. So just to remind you of it, um, I'm gonna call up person here. Uh, so here we had a, a set of states in the model and we ran the model, uh, we simulated it and we saw some emergent behavior, emergent behavior uh, in terms of uh, uh, prevalence of infection and emergent behavior in terms of quantities such as uh, such as the uh, number of uh, infections that a person has experienced over time versus their income. So if we were to talk about 
endogenous quantities for the model, quantities that it's generating. Can anyone give me a quantity that this model generates by its behavior? We don't tell it, it tells us. Anyone? What's the quantity this generates? What's something that it generates? It generates lots of relationships. Give me, give me some of them. I can see some right here. Infected. Yeah, count infected. Yeah. Infected, occurrence of infection. Oh, it died out. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so a count of, uh, infected is is certainly one of those quantities. Um, are there other things that it generates that we didn't put into it, but rather it gave rise to it? There's actually a bunch of them. Can anyone give me another one? Well, basically any of these graphs we're looking at, well, not uh, well, just about anyone we're looking at. I would say we want to be cautious. Not uh, it, It's arguable this one here income versus connection count. You could argue either way here. It's not dynamic. This was imposed at the starting time. It came about because of how we laid people out by income on the one hand and randomly on the other and the connect and the distance um, within which two people would be connected. Uh, that did influence it. Um, but it was really a static, uh, static quantity. By contrast, this count infected in this relationship between income and count of times infected, we didn't put that into there. That actually results over time from this model. And you know, if we were to speed this up further, uh, we would see that taking shape here at any one time. It is a certain shape, but then it goes to sort of a an asymptotic shape, although it, it moves its way up over time. It, it goes to a sort of, a, converges to a certain shape. So we didn't put that into the model. It emerged from it. What type of quantities in this model would be, by contrast, exogenous? Can anyone say? What things are told to the model to assume this or assume that? Anyone? Yes. The parameters. Yeah, the parameter values, both those specified explicitly, right? Um, in, for example, this uh, this mean latent period, this distance threshold by which to connect people if they lie to people if they lie within that distance, um, the mean infectious period, the contact rate, and duration of immunity, those are all things which um, which are told to the model, assume this. But in general, we might have pre-specified assumptions that are, um, that are not fixed. They're not just scalar quantities. They might be the unemployment rate over time to assume, or the uh, availability of fentanyl to assume over time. Or it might be something to do with the availability of certain life-saving drugs like remdesivir and dethamexazone and Paxlovid and so on in the COVID context, right? Um, the availability of certain therapeutics, uh, of vaccinations. These might be things that we tell to the model, assume at this time that, you know, this vaccine is involved, that it's, it's uh, available. Assume at that time it's available. Um, similarly, you know, for a COVID model, we could say, okay, we're going to impose that at starting at, you know, with a certain month, there'll be um, Delta variant introduced. Uh, starting at that month, it'll be Alpha variant. Starting at this month, uh, Omicron. Those would be things we could pose to the model. And it simulates the consequences of those, but fundamentally the, the timing of introduction uh, might be uh, might be constant. Um, I think you get the basic idea there, but I would just remind us that um, if we went to our smoking and heart disease model, by contrast here, um, we have a different set of quantities which are which are 
produced um, by the model, which are endogenous versus exogenous. So what things for this model, for this model of smoking and heart disease would be endogenous? Anyone? What things here are endogenous? Most of the time we graph out endogenous, things produced by the model. Because, I mean, we could show on a graph what we tell it to assume, but maybe the graph includes that, but generally we're, we're interested in what we learn from the model. So most of the time we look at egg endogenous things. All these quantities are endogenous, the count of quit distribution, the cumulative time smoke, the annual heart disease incident, the cumulative deaths with heart disease. Those are all endogenous, right? Um, okay. Um, so, so, you know, uh, exogenous things, what things here are exogenous? Hmm? You look at a scenario, what things here are endogenous? Rate of death from heart disease. Yeah, the assumptions we impose on initiation rate, cessation rate, relapse rate. Now, I'm half expecting sometime in the next day, day and a half, to come back and make this initiation rate a table function of eight. That's something I kind of like to do, to reflect the fact that people commonly smoke at certain ages and not at others, and we could make, we could make it a distribution by age and draw value from it for when a given person, when and if a given person starts smoking. But those would be examples of, um, of of exogenous quantities, the, the the ones that are specified here. So why am I emphasizing this in this talk? Because all three of these traditions, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, have the same distinction. You figure out, they're all dynamic modeling traditions. You figure out what we're gonna tell the model, what's exogenous, what the model's gonna produce for us, what the model's gonna tell us, and what things are omitted from the model, what we call ignored. And often those ignored factors are consciously ignored, but there's gonna be many you're not even thinking of ignoring. Um, but it's good to you know, consider, okay, what things are we ignoring? What things are we putting in the parking lot? Maybe we'll add them later if it seems to make sense. Um, okay, so let's talk about these methods. These methods um, share more in common than divide some. But at a glance, they look very different. And we could talk about three levels. I'd like to talk about three levels of differences between these types of models. Um, some that are more uh, some that are more basic and some that are more um, uh, that are more surface level, sufficient. So at a surface level, if you see these methods, if you see a, a discrete event simulation flow graph, work workflow, versus a stock flow model, versus a set of state charts and agents and networks, you'll say, wow, those look totally different. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason they have between them. But the truth is they, they actually have much more in common, just like we and chimps have, what, 97% of our DNA in common or something like that. We have a lot in common. At the surface level, there's these differences in visual representation. There's this different vocabulary. You know, there's, there's different skill sets required. Age-based modeling requires more code than than discrete event simulation, which requires more than, than uh, stock flow. Deeper, there's this difference in the form and in, in the formalisms um, and, and, and required model design skill set of how you build the model is different. But more fundamental than that are differences in the questions they're normally asked, they're normally used to investigate. What, what types of questions do people investigate with system dynamics? versus with with discrete event simulation versus with um with uh, agent based modeling 
So the three traditions we're going to be talking about are, are there. We're, we're dealing in centrally with agent-based modeling in this boot camp, where we're going to be talking about system dynamics or compartmental modeling uh, and discrete event simulation. So um, I'm going to whip through this because um, we, once again, we have an early lunch. And the goal here is to really situate you for discussing hybrid methods and to use particular hybrid approach for health economics models. It's not to make you experts here. So you should be aware that system dynamics is a tradition with a very strong philosophical perspective, a very strong perspective on the world, focused on feedbacks and accumulations. And, um, and it's broadly a, a methodology to help us conceptualize, describe, analyze, and, and manage feedback. Systems. It has qualitative and quantitative components, and it's long, more so than either of the other church traditions. Long emphasized participatory engagement, uh, engagement and sets of stakeholders. Um, starting, uh, starting in the eight by the eighties, and maybe by by the the nineteen seventies. Um, so you know, good fifty years or so. Um, and one of its foremost goals for decades has been to alter mental models, how people think about a situation. The ways in which they reason about it. And, oh, wait. Someone could record that in the AV failures. Thanks. Um, and the perspective here, you know, comes out of many of those experiments in their predecessors that I mentioned my first day, right? That people are really bad making choices about complex systems, and it causes all sorts of problems when we make poor choices about these systems. It leads to policy resistance. It leads to big initiatives that are that are heavily funded but fail. It leads to cynicism. It leads to frustration. And it leads to loss of human potential. Um, and system dynamics has traditionally emphasized improving how people make decisions, and um, and improving mental models as a key part. That's been traditionally less of a central focus in discrete event simulation, uh, which has been more technocratic. In the early years of agent-based modeling, it also, it was more focused in its early years on scientific exploration and less on decision-making. Um, but to the degree it's been used in decision-making, it's been um, more a matter of, 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 of expert people pursuing it with expertise than to change people's mental models. Um, so system dynamics, as I, as I noted, emphasizes feedbacks in a community. Um, and you know, there's this notion that, look, our cognitive limits leave us vulnerable to blowback. We make dumb decisions in complex systems and that causes us a lot of grief. And by using a model, often a fairly simple model, we can improve our thinking and the thinking of decisions, and we involve them in our modeling. Okay, there we go again. Okay. Um, okay, so um, notable on the system dynamics front compared to either of the other methods is that there's actually heavy use of qualitative methods. You saw it in Jenna's talk earlier with causal loop diagrams. And these have a traditional but underappreciated mathematical relationship with stock flow models. Um, but they're used to capture people's mental models of people without any modeling background. And generally people can be trained on them within 15 minutes to half an hour, and then you can use it to, to, to draw out 
perspectives on a situation. Okay, there we go again. Third time. Um, uh, but there's many uses of system dynamics that are, are by contrast, very quantitative and technical. Um, occasionally involving individual-based models. So we will see this in spades within our hybrid models. In particular, I view system dynamics tool set as extremely beautiful for describing theories of continuous, of, of systems involving what I'll call continuous quantities. Look, if you have a reservoir, um, that you're dealing with that can be contaminated for cholera. That's a great example to use a stock and plug, right? Um, it's literally the plumbing. Um, but beyond that fourth time, Wade, um, uh, beyond that, um, we have uh, needs for representing with system dynamics, uh, stock flow, we can represent things like um, a viral load level or levels of craving for a substance, or levels of fentanyl in the system. Um, uh, we can use it to represent uh, stress levels, factors that have continuous dynamics associated. Okay, so system dynamics is tended to really uh, foster participatory engagement. Um, and this does mean often making use of simpler models. Um, but it also means using model forms that are easier to understand. Jenna went through this before. These are causal loop diagrams. But one thing that um, Jenna wasn't as much emphasizing that I want to bring out is that one of the big reasons we build causal loop diagrams in system dynamics is because of the causal loops involved. Now, that may sound tautological, but what I mean is that from a system dynamics perspective, the feedbacks are where the actions are. It's the feedback structure of the system by which it evolves um, that, that govern its evolution. And feedbacks lead to characteristic behaviors. So a balancing feedback like this one, a, a, a so-called negative feedback, um, also called balancing, tends to lead to stable behavior or with a delay to, to oscillatory behavior. Um, by contrast, uh, feedbacks that are positive feedbacks, that, that doesn't mean good, it means that they are reinforcing, that a, a change in one thing leads to a ripple, ripple through a set of effects which amplify the original change. That's what it means by positive feedback, much as if I were using a microphone and it started to squeal and it picked it up in the speakers and starts to squeal louder and louder and louder. That's what we call informally feedback on an audio level, right? With AV equipment, this leads to a snowball effect where change gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Um, that can be good or it can be bad, right? Give me a case of this sort of exponential behavior where one thing begets two things, begets four things, begets eight, begets 16, and so on, and it grows exponentially. Give me one example where that would be considered not desirable, bad. You wouldn't want it. Spread of what? Any disease. Yeah, yeah, of, of a communicable disease, right? One person with COVID begets two, begets four, begets eight, et cetera. Um, it spreads. It could be a lot more than two to the, you know, by generation by generation. There can be cases like this that are viewed as very desirable, right? People want their messages to go viral, right? Um, on social media, people want want to make money as a company, but grow, grow, you know, your startup successively in an exponential way, et cetera. They want to draw customers in by word of mouth and. You know, each new customer you get, get five more because they spread, you know, they talk about your product or service and they buy more, right? So positive feedbacks, these, these reinforcing feedbacks are sometimes sought. They're sometimes avoided, but they shape the system in big ways. And these sort of negative feedbacks, these sort of balancing feedbacks shape the system in big ways. 
they lead to resistance to change. They need to lead to inertia. They lead to stability. And that can be good and it can be bad. Negative feedbacks can keep you in poverty. Negative feedbacks can prevent you from breaking out of an adverse situation. You know, where um, a person seeks to leave a relationship, the abuser um, scares them, and they cease to try to stop leaving the relationship, right? That can be an entrapping situation. But the point is, in all these cases, they change system behavior. Um, it, and it alters it dramatically. And in system dynamics, generally these feedbacks are viewed as the key determiners of behavior. Collectively, they dictate behavior. And in a nonlinear system, it shifts between the dominant feedbacks over time. And there are tools in system dynamics we use to graph that out over time and see which feedbacks are dominant. So when we have multiple feedbacks, they interplay and at one time, one will be dominant, another time, another will be dominant. So maybe initially we'll be growing our customers, but eventually we'll draw the, the, the stock of potential customers low enough, this becomes the constraint, and we won't so much get the positive feedback we had initially, it will start to plateau. Of course, with spread of a communicable disease, this might be spread person to person, and this is reducing the number of susceptibles. And once we reduce the number of susceptibles too low, it'll tend to plateau. So feedback orientation is central in system dynamics. So when you see these diagrams, please don't think of them as just kind of, oh, they're kind of a nice, pretty way of sort of doing concept mapping. They, they, they let us kind of share thoughts on, on our perspective on the situation in some you know, some words and, and arrows sort of way. No, there, there's actually something deeper than that. Um, and, you know, people who use these diagrams a lot in a facilitated way, they will tell stories about the behavior of the system in terms of the feedbacks. Now, I want to make clear, causal of diagrams have many virtues to recommend them, many strengths that that uh, make them excellent tools for engagement. But there are many things they cannot do. A causal diagram is not going to allow you to simulate a system. You can't simulate a causal diagram. I have had folks who have asked me before, they say, I have this causal diagram. Can you simulate this for me? And the answer is no. Because a causal diagram, while it does encode some very important semantic information about the system, encode some important mathematical information, it's not precise enough, it's not unambiguous enough to allow for, for, for dictating how it evolves. It's just, it, it doesn't have that requisite level of precision. Um, you can use sort of general archetypes and you know, um, describe appeal to the behavior another blank way. Um, but it's not precise enough to 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 um, to characterize its evolution. Okay, now in system dynamics, causal diagrams. I wanted to spend a bit of time on that because you would have seen it with Jenna, and um, and you should know that they because they have more to them than just pretty pictures, more to them than just words and, and directional arrows. They, they actually have some extra understanding. Jenna emphasized it, but I wanted to emphasize it again. This, this issue of polarity, I should probably say, I mean, it, at a certain level, the polarity here in a given link, when you compose links, I mean, when you compose links, you get you get them composing according to the rule of signs, right? Um, uh, and so, if you have a negative followed by positive, you get a negative, right? If you have three negatives in a row, you get a negative. If you have two negatives in a row, you get a positive. Minus times minus is plus. Minus times plus is minus, right? Um, so that there's a composition rule that gives 
that gives um, the polarity associated with paths, and and that implies polarity associated with with loops, and that implies something about the behavior of the larger system. And again, you get sort of competing loops for dominance, and there's a rich story there. Um, but when we go to simulate it quantitatively, we go beyond that, and we put into place character oops characterizations of system structure in a language that is more specific, that is more that that sharpens our distinctions. It looks like a seventh time weight, just blanking. Would um. Would one of the TAs uh, be able to go see if Greg Oster? What's that? Oh, Larissa's. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in a system dynamics context, when we start with these sort of uh, causal loops, um, we're, we're capturing a lot of mathematical structure there. But we can sharpen it further, even before we get to putting in a totally unambiguous specification mathematically. And that is by introducing stock, a distinction between stocks and flows. And this distinction is brought out in something called a system structure. Um, these are less talked about than, than causal loops on the one hand and stock and flow diagrams, but they're in between them where we break out What's a stock? What's a flow? Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. So Jun Chiao, yes, it's um, uh, polarity. So what we call a polarity, we call this this um, uh, attribution of a sign here um, associated with a given directional arrow. We we speak of that as a polarity of the arrow, and these polarities of these individual arrows compose. Uh, so in other words, you, you put them end to end, this one with this one, and you get a polarity of a lot of a connection from this one to this one um, implied. So these arrows represent posited causal linkages from one of the factors to another. OK, um, uh, that that we we posit. Um, according to the type of reasoning that that um, Jenna used before, that there's a certain polarity of the relationship, and then they compose a time a plus and a plus composed to a plus. So if you have a plus of risk, a perceived level of risk to perception of surplus risk, and one from perception of surplus risk to measures undertaken to lessen risk, you get a plus link implied of from the composing these two arrows end to end, an implied one from implied causal relationship from perceived level of risk to measures to lessen risk. Um, and a plus and a minus will compose to a minus. Um, a minus and a minus will compose to a minus, et cetera. So those, these are called polarities and they induce polarities for paths. And some of those paths are loops themselves, are, are loops, okay? Um, and these, Types of loops induce behavior. They certain characteristic behavior. A negative feedback loop induced by the polarity of the links exhibits um, uh, stability in behavior. A positive feedback loop, as induced by its links, induces um, uh, divergent or unstable behavior. And a negative feedback loop with Delays exhibits oscillatory behavior, and there's mathematical reasons for this. So commonly, if you have a positive and negative feedback loop next to each other, they exhibit sigmoidal behavior. We see this with infection spread, right? Um, you have a spread of, of an infection in the population. It spreads person to person. It drains the number of susceptibles and the number of people rise, 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 and to, to some peak. Not shown here as a recovery loop, but uh, that would then drop down. Um, okay. Uh, so let's sharpen these distinctions by introducing a distinction between stocks and flows. We're going to see this in our hybrid models. So I want you to understand this language. Okay. Um, 
So, so we distinguish between two types of building blocks here, or two types of variables, really. Um, here we, we sort of treated all variables as kind of the same sort of thing. You can have more of it, you can have less of it. Now we have two distinctions between the variable types. Each of them can have more or less, but they're, they're different types of ones. One is a stock that's shown as a rectangle. One is a flow. A stock represents an accumulation, okay? It represents part of the state of the system, a certain situation. It's, it's an accumulation of of people, it's a, in this case, collection of people, a collection of people um, who are, you know, survivors of past attempts to, to take their life, um, or people who, who used to be um, in, in that category, but have, have now shed uh, suicidal ideation. By contrast, um, flows. So, so if you froze the system in time, if you were to freeze it in time, you could go count the number of people in different states. Um, this is uh, you know, one example, but we could have an example from hospital where we have a number of people in the emergency room, a number of people in the, you know, in the medicine ward, in the surgical ward. Um, and if we froze time, we could go in and count how many people are there in the emergency room, how many in the medical ward, and how many in the surgical ward, right? It's a it's 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 the state of the system at any one time you could ask how many what's the the value of this stock this could be as simple as a water in a bathtub at any one time there's an amount of water in the bathtub by contrast and i need to this thing i'm, I'm making this distinction for a very specific reason those are stocks by contrast the flows are change over time right um uh, if we asked how quickly the South Saskatchewan River, which lies yonder, um, uh, how quickly that's flowing, what's its rate of flow, you can't measure that at any one time, right? You can't go like freeze time and go and see, oh, the rate is this. No, no, no. You have to, you have to say, okay, well, how much, how how much flows past over some period of time? Traditionally, the way of doing that is. So I once drove a, a well. I once drove a sandpoint well. Pumped it into the ground together with some neighbors. And, you know, we pumped and we drove water out of it. It was sandy at first, and then it was fresh water. So we asked, you know, how quickly can I get water out? Well, um, let's see what the rate of flow is. And so what I did is, you know, I, I, I went for a minute, and I saw how much water I pumped. And I saw how much water in a bucket I got out, right? That's the rate of flow. Sort of like you you ask, how much would you accumulate in a certain period of time? To ask how, how what its it, rates of change are, right? So, so a flow would be things like, this might be the water in the bathtub. This might be how, the rate with which water is going out of the bathtub. This is the rate with which it's coming into the bathtub, right? Or maybe this is, Maybe this is the number of people in the emergency room. The inflow would be people coming in per hour from the street. The outflow is people, you know, one outflow is people leaving back back to their lives. The other is people admitted to the to the uh, wards of the hospital. Um, maybe to each of the wards there'd be a flow. So a flow is not something you assess at any moment in time. It's change over time number of people coming in to the hospital in that period of time, number of people dying per week. You don't say, you know, um, right now at this instant, there's a hundred people, you know, a hundred people um, are dying in this instant. No, 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 it's, it's like number of people that die over time. Um, so we distinguish between stocks and flows in a mall. Okay? We distinguish quantities that are aspects of the state of the system versus quantities that are chain, represent change in the system or rates of change in the system. This might be a, a, a simpler example to understand perhaps. Um, so susceptible, infected, and temporarily immune people, these are stocks. These are 
part of the state of the system. There's counter people there at any one time. And there's flows into them with new infections into infectious and flows out new recovery. And again, at any one point in time, there's a number of people infectious. Um, but over time, there's people getting infectious and over time, there's people recovering. Hmm? Does that make sense to people? Now, the important thing here is that this is something that's sharper in its details than, than a causal loop diagram. Right. Um, in other words, in a causal loop diagram, we're distinguishing different variables, but we're not just seeing whether they're stocks and flows. They have to be have a sense of um, having more or less of it at some level of directionality. Here, the stocks have a sense of more or less. You can have more people infectious or fewer. And so do the flows, more infections or fewer infections per unit time but they're distinct in terms of their units. Um, one is over time and the other is uh, at any any one time. So, so here we have stocks and flows, okay? Um, as added to our uh, vocabulary. And it's just dynamics. Stocks um, represent the state of the system. Often they are associated with inertia, they give rise to delays because it takes time to build up the stock. It takes time to drain the stock. If you have a, uh, a stock of virions in your body, of viral particles, it takes time to drain that. Um, it, by contrast, it takes time to you know train a certain number of doctors and build up a stock of physicians or or um, to if you have a really full emergency room, it takes time to discharge them. So stocks are really central to kind of phenomena of sort of uh, what we call disequilibrium, sort of cases where the system is 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 has memory and changes over time in big ways. By contrast, flows are um, are these quantities that are um, represent change over time, and they are the determiners of the change of stocks. So stocks by themselves don't change. They change by virtue of the flows into and out of them, right? They're drained by flows out. They're replenished by flows in, just like the water in your bathtub. It's replenished by water coming in and it's, drained by water going out, whether it's through the emergency valve or the or the um, drain in the, the bottom of it or what have you. Um, so flows are the verbs. Stocks are the nouns. Stocks are the current situation, the current state. Flows are the change in the state over time the action and that state only changes via the the flows okay um so these are the flows in red here right these are the flows in red um and the two go together right like stocks change because of flows and the values of the flows um are determined by by the values of the stocks at this time generally so if you have lots of people in the emergency room, there's going to be more flow out over time than if there's than if there's few people in the emergency room. If there's lots of people who are susceptible in general, there's going to be a greater flow down here than if there were fewer. Um, uh, and the number of new infections is going to depend on two stocks. Which two stocks is this going to depend on in general? Number of new infections. Can anyone say? What are the two stocks? that will dictate the evolution of the number of new infections. Mm -hmm. Oh, surely, oh, yeah, the susceptible and, and what? There's two stocks. It takes two to tango. Ain't gonna be no new infections sure. unless they're susceptibles, but you need something else. Currently diseased. Yeah, the people are infected. So the values of the stocks dictate the values of the flows. Stocks only change because of the flows. So, so that's why I say they're intertwined like this, right? 
the stocks, the stocks now determine the values of the flows. Now, the flows dictate the rate of change of accumulation in the stocks. And if the outflow of a stock is greater than the inflow, the outflow of your bathtub is greater than the inflow. Is the water in the bathtub going to go up or down? If people are getting infected faster than the then they're losing immunity. Is the number of susceptibles going to go up or down? Or, or equally, if the number of infectives, the number of recover, the, the rate at which people are recovering, people per day recovering is greater than people becoming infective uh, per day, is the number of people who are infective going to go up or down? So if the rate out is greater than the rate in, it's going to go... Down, down. If the rate in is greater than the rate up, uh, the rate out, it's going to go up. Right? Um, you may, what's that? Well, yeah, but we're asking about any one flow, we're focused, or any one stock, we're focusing the outflows and the inflows from that. And we're asking, is that stock going uh, up or down? If the rate of outflow is greater than the rate of inflow, the stock's going to go down. If the rate of inflow is greater than the rate of outflow, the stock is going to go up. Um, okay. Um, yeah. I um I will say, you know, system dynamics um is fruitfully combined with uh machine learning and and uh, computational statistics methods. Uh our lab has done an extensive amount with that, and it's it's a great strength. It also allows for explicit formal reasoning mathematically. Um, it's really, really nice. And we'll see this in the example models, hybrid models, to represent continuous dynamics. If you want to represent weight change over time in a person and the factors that build weight and lose weight. If you want to represent um, uh, viral dynamics within a person. If you were to represent the dynamics associated with stress and fear, right, and trust, um, and an intimate partner violence, a relationship be set by intimate partner violence. If you want to represent uh, viral load levels uh, in the context of spread of infection by people with different levels of immunocompetence, you can do this very, very, very nice. Um, you want to represent uh, color of reservoirs, as I said earlier, and and the dynamics as as uh, sanitary conditions change, how cholera levels in the reservoir change. It's, it's you know wonderful tool for that. And there's a lot of theory articulated as in a way that can be articulated as stocks and flows. It does allow rapid modeling proto of prototyping. It's quite amenable to participatory modeling. It's very visually um, transparent. And you can reason in terms of the diagrams rather than the underlying math. Um, uh, you're, you're not as beholden to having to reason purely with the equations. No, no, no. You're, you're doing so generally with the diagrams, inflow, gradient, outflow, et cetera. Um, reason about the feedback uh, loops. Okay. Um, and it's generally, you know, has minimal uh, dependence on any sort of uh, a formal program. But it does require, you know, a modeling skill to, to build up models. Um, sometimes it requires more finesse um, because of limited vocabulary. Okay, we've been talking about agent-based modeling in this boot camp, so I'm, I'm not going to, to go through that, but I do want to talk about discrete event modeling. Okay, now, discrete event modeling is a bit different from on... There are differences between, on the one hand, agent-based modeling and system dynamics modeling, as a, a, the two of them, and on the other, discrete event modeling. Um, all of them share a tremendous amount in common. They're all dynamic modeling methods. They all share a depiction of the, the evolution of a common state. They all depict the change in the next little bit based on the current state, but, and then see the, the um, emergent results of that. But um, discrete event modeling is more, somewhat a more specialized tradition. So mark my words, discrete event modeling 
is an exquisite tool for characterizing resource constrained workflow situations where the where you're you, particularly for service delivery where your ability to determine service is limited by availability of resources there's well defined workflows and the ability to deliver for <clears throat> so operate upon the items flowing through the workflows is contention on having another blanking weight, uh, having available uh, resources. So imagine people coming into a clinic, okay? Let's, 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 go, build, let's go open a model. Let's go, let's go open a model for this. It's, it's, it's easier to see with a model. Um, so I'm going to any logic. I'd like you to go here uh, in any logic, um, go to help, example models okay um and if you scroll down there's a thing called trauma center so where did i go i went to help tas you ready help example models and i i scrolled down here on the right hand side sorry um the right hand side there's a trauma center okay like you to to open up trauma center okay <laughs> so i i want to uh, illustrate um some of these principles that uh i'm going to be describing here um so specifically here's a depiction of a um work environment and we have a defined workflow with patient arrival, workup of the patient, uh, triage of them by a triage nurse, figuring out their level of acuity. And, um, and that workflow is different if they enter via ambulance when they're routed down here uh, versus if they're a walk-in patient. But there's a set of stages in the workflow is indicated by these operators, these are called process blocks. And you'll notice the kind of structured character of this. There are branches, there's successive processes here, there's merging together of, of flows, et cetera. Um, so here we have a, uh, a structured workflow. Um, the ability to progress down this workflow is contention on the availability of resources. So for example, in order to uh, here uh, be treated, um, I, I, I'm gonna go up here, they have to be treated, um, they're going to need a triage room. So if you look at this block, in order for that to be undertaken, they need a triage, uh, they're gonna need to, uh, to go to a, a triage room here. So they're gonna, it's actually not represented here as a resource. They undergo triage. They need a triage nurse to undergo that. They need to talk to the triage nurse. If the triage nurse is not available, they will wait. They will be placed in a queue. And when that triage nurse is available for them, they will be operated upon by that triage nurse and proceed down here um uh and and they will go here to a waiting room but they they need to get uh their case needs to get to the assistance of a registrar who will register them um so here uh they this patient is flowing through this workflow they're a so-called entity sometimes simply called an agent and they flow through the workflow but they wait at various stages for these resources, people like, of these resources like the triage nurse uh, or like the, the, um, the registrar to, uh, for whom they're waiting uh, and or it could be for an x-ray machine. Um, 
So here, for example, they're waiting for an X-ray room as well as the availability of an X-ray tech. If either is not available, if the room's available but not the technician, or the technician is available but not the room, they will be placed in a queue waiting. Yes, wait. So there's an online question about system dynamics. I don't know if you answer that. Um. Uh, sure. I'll I'll come back uh to that. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Okay. Um. So um, here we have these these structured workflows. Uh, there are entities flowing down this workflow. In many of our cases, it's service delivery for patients, but it could be service delivery for those enrolling in the Affordable Care Act, um, according to the Affordable Care Act, or it could be individuals signing up for, you know, VA coverage uh, in the U.S. Uh, for Veterans Administration coverage. Um, they flow through the system, but their progress there depends on resources and resource unavailability leads to queues, although they might choose to leave if they haven't, um, they have a certain measure of agency if the queue keeps them waiting for too long. Generally, the resource pools that are required to make progress are capacitated, meaning they're of limited capacity. Now, why would you build a system like this? It, it, it hopefully should be obvious that you know, it has a rather um, specific feel to it. Um, why would you do it? Well, it's an exquisite tool for looking at the impact. Uh, it, if we're, we're representing this class of systems, it has no peer in terms of ease of representing them. You can crisply represent these workflows, their dependency uh, for progress on resource, availability of resources, um, the queuing behavior, and you can use this to ask about the consequences of bringing different levels of resources to bear. Let's suppose we add two other um, x-ray techs in another x-ray room. How much would that help? Um, suppose that we were to add nurses to the emergency room, but not another physician or technically more beds. How much would that speed up the processing? Suppose we were to uh, make available another VQ scanner or a portable ultrasound machine for to be, bring around different procedure rooms. How much would that facilitate our ability to deliver for our patients? Um, often the interests here are in a few outcome measures. You might anticipate them. Um, if you know something about health service delivery, um, the number of patients you can see per day, the quality of care you can deliver for those patients, often measured in a more domain specific way, how long people are kept waiting, um, sometimes how long the waiting lists are. Um, these are aspects of the situation we can examine how they change if we have more resources. And we can also examine how they change if we place these resources differently. So you'll notice that this, um, this context has a very specific physical embodiment here, right? Um, there are uh, ED rooms, there are X-ray rooms located at certain places. The waiting room is located at certain places. And within this context, there's generally an endogenized movement phenomena whereby how long it takes for someone to go, say, from the x-ray room to the operating theater in a gurney or on a wheelchair is actually assessed by simulating over time their movement within the facility. And this matters if you have a facility that's quite large and you have physicians moving around and nurses moving around and allied health professionals moving around, as uh, Aisha can attest. Um, so if you have a facility that's spread out, say a ward of a hospital spread between two different floors, 
um, you're going to spend a lot of time moving around. Um, uh, and that's, that may impact patient care. It may impact the ability to deliver team-based patient care because other members of your interdisciplinary team may be in the other half ward. Um, and a model of this sort is an almost ideal vehicle for examining situations like that. So uh, if we go and we uh, take this model and we simulate it, we're gonna go simulate this trauma center, which is which depicts such a healthcare facility. And what we will see is um, the facility uh, illustrated in 3D. So you recall, this is the emergency room. Here you have patients coming in, some from ambulances. You can see an ambulance arrival here, um, going to certain patient rooms. Others through a, on a walk-in capacity going to um, the triage nurse, going to the registrar and, and awaiting, um, awaiting uh, care based on their, their triage level. Um, and then being brought to procedure rooms where they're examined by particular members of the interdisciplinary team. And you have the team moving around in this facility, right? Um, you notice patients starting to back up here. And we might be concerned about patient waiting times in this uh, initial area. Um, but you could see this, the coordination that's going on between these uh, uh, different members of this whole system, whether it's the patient with nurses, physicians, registrar, the triage nurse in particular, x-ray techs, uh, and you can see something about the availability of gurneys, these beds, these, um, uh, these wheelchairs, et cetera. So as you can see, this provides a, a, a picture of, or a, um, a glimpse of the operation of a service um, a delivery facility, right? Um, and the coordination among these different parties depends on availability and placement of resources. Um, and it's these things we can examine. Um, within this context, we can place resource pools, for example, uh, at certain places within the facility, and those may um, facilitate this uh, this movement here. Um, so we have uh, within this context um, the set of uh, set of resources um, of different sorts and. Uh, if we poke around here, and I'd have to remember exactly where they are in this um, uh, in this particular simulation, but um, there's a set of uh, statistics we can compute on the um, availability of nurses or the availability of uh, of physicians, for example. Um, this is a uh, five or six points uh, acuity scale for patients. This is the length of stay um, that they've been in the facility. Um, and and you can examine the effects, for example, of uh, operating hours at the facility in order to, to examine how those operating hours might affect length of stay and, and um, utilization levels of the, um, of the staff. These different resources can be changed in the number of available parties. But as you can imagine, if you're not addressing the bottleneck resources, if you're not addressing the ones that are actually keeping people waiting, the binding constraints, you, you may not speed things up by increasing resources of certain types. It may be, and, and a model like this can help you focus on what are the bottlenecks within the system? Is it movement time? Is it availability of a, of a certain room type? Is it availability of a certain equipment type? Is it availability of a certain you know, resource like a nurse or doctor, a, 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 a human, um, human resource uh, of some sort? Um, is it something about their ability to meet that's the bottleneck? Is it something about the uh, uh, you know the the uh, availability of spots to discharge to which to discharge patients that are delaying their discharges.
these are things that could be an examined in a model such as this. Um, now, these sort of service delivery models have more um, defined scope often than what we've been examining thus far. Commonly, not always, but commonly, they focus on a certain facility, right? And the operation of the facility. Once someone walks out the door, generally they're out of the model. That agent, that entity disappears from the model. By contrast, in system dynamics and agent-based modeling, generally we, we include a representation of people in the community as well. Here, we're often focused on these structured workflows, very specifically, rather than following people in a life course sort of way. But this does give a sense of um, some aspects of discrete event modeling, and you'll see that sort of modeling writ large in a lot of our uh, example models, partic particularly when paired with um, agent-based model. Okay, um, I think uh, I'll, I'll stop my comments on those models now and and I'll answer questions, uh, Jun Chow's first, <clears throat> and then I'll seek to um, to talk about hybrid models and, and walk you through a set of compelling patterns for hybrid modeling. Okay, so there's a question here. Um, uh, regarding system dynamics, because it takes quite some uh, effort to operationalize the causal diagram to simulation, I'm shy of using it for participatory manner. I'm afraid it will disappoint the participants by being unable to turn their insights into uh, into a running model on the spot. What is your experience or take on this? Yeah. Um, so um, to your great credit, Jun Xiao, you've um, put your finger on, um, uh, you know, a very uh, reasonable, um, common and... Uh, important consideration when it comes to um, setting expectations for participatory modeling. Um, and when it comes to choosing the formalisms we use for participatory modeling. And you will find different modeling teams responding to these challenges in different ways, okay? And I'm just going to um, in short succession, comment on a couple ways that people try to navigate this tension about which you speak, okay? Um, one way to, to, to seek to navigate this tension is to use causal diagrams with the avowed focus as the avowed focus of your work to, to not promise or intimate that one's going to go beyond that and to use them to engage with participants predominantly as a way of gathering understanding uh, I, almost in a so so you know within the health sphere right we have different types of analysis i have some colleagues of mine who are extraordinarily skilled in qualitative methods right um, who who do uh, uh, interviews of, of individuals, who run focus groups. Um, they create transcripts, which they analyze with en vivo, et cetera, and, and do narrative synthesis and, and analyze um, participant, you know, uh, uh, participant narratives. Um, and uh, I respect that work. I think it lends some insights. And you could argue that that cause of diagrams allow you to bring together narratives in a way that's more quantitative. It, it, it's, not, it's not purely qualitative, right? Like you can reason about feedback structure and you can reason about, about how those narratives as captured by causal of diagrams um, are different between different groups in more of a crisp way um, than if it were written text. It's, it's something that's more structured than that. And you can 
use that understanding to reason about why we might see patterns from the world. But it's not, and, and this is very important, it's not something that's fully quantitative. You cannot, as you say, translate it directly into a simulation. But you can argue that, okay, you know, these feedbacks can account for, you know, plausibly account, plausibly account for certain types of phenomena we see um, within the system. Now, it turns out that um, these sorts of diagrams, uh, causal diagrams, um, although it's um, although it's not been a major tradition in causal loops, it has been a minor tradition in causal loops to formally analyze these diagrams using tools that quantitatively shed light on the role that different variables play. For example, you find gateway variables. You find variables that are present on many feedback loops. I spoke from this floor not one hour thence about the fact that from a system dynamics standpoint, feedback loops are the are lent particular attention as they are viewed as the primary determiners of system behavior. And as such, you might ask, okay, are there you know ranked variables by um, the number of feedback loops of which they are part? You can identify independent feedback loops. You can identify variables that are present as sort of a crossroads of the facts that they're key kind of keystone variables by virtue of the fact that they link up different areas of the diagram. And you can, you can convince yourself often in many cases that those variables play a particularly important role, not only in people's heads, people's minds, but also in, um, in terms of uh, the um, the role they play dynamically within the system, uh, now um, we 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 do build tools of this sort, um, uh, and in this room, um, uh, EGA has been party to to some of that work at a certain at a certain level. Um, uh, but I will say that um, you know it's a different. Uh, I would not disagree. It's a, it's a rather different flavor than simulation, right? Um, uh, you can argue that it uh, brings to the table um, uh, some important insights, and I, I don't disagree. You can argue that it can be more effective in capturing, um, or that, that it brings extra richness in, in capturing qualitative understanding of parties than do just purely narrative textual depictions, and I will certainly agree. Um, uh, but it is it is not the same, <laughs> and it it does not directly translate into um, stock and flow. Um, so so this is um, that this is one way. I'm I'm going to go through a, a set of others that um, people have nav navigated this, but I do want to. Um, I, I do want to show a diagram uh, here, and uh, the question is, am I going to be able to find it quick enough? Because it might, it might, it might be helpful for many here to see this diagram. It's by my, by my esteemed colleague Peter Hoffman, who's a master practitioner uh, of, of. Uh, of uh, community-based system dynamics and causal loop diagram. Um, and the question is, do I have it? And it's not looking uh, awfully hopeful here. Um, it's a beautiful diagram and I, I'll probably just have to get it at, um, at some later point. Okay, um, so let me go, go through a second um, a second thing that uh, people do to navigate this, Jun Xiao. So a second thing they do is to, to say, okay, uh, causal diagrams are a little bit too squishy for me. Um, I'm going to do work in system structure diagrams, which are like causal loop diagrams, but make the distinction further between, um, sorry, uh, between uh, variables that are stocks and variables that are flows. Okay. Um, 
And here's a system structure diagram. Here we have, you'll notice we have um, lots of variables, lots of links with polarities, we have loops illustrated, but we also have a distinction between socks and flows for, for many of the core variables. And uh, a diagram like this will start to use participatory processes to elicit understanding and communicate understanding of which variables are accumulations and which is which are changes over time. And it'll make it easier to then jump off and build up, in this case, a system dynamics model of a portion of this model. Maybe not all, typically not all, but a portion of it. Um, and still be somewhat true to a lot of what came out of the, 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 the group model building. But they don't do that analysis immediately, that the quantitative testing of the model. But they will use this as like an intermediate. And they will use it to sharpen discussion here. It turns out, I don't have time to go into it, but it turns out the dynamics associated with um, stocks and flows are, 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 are distinctive. Um, we talked earlier, you know, at a basic level, a, a stock goes up if the sum of the flows in is greater than the sum of the flows out, right? It'll go down if the sum of the flows out is greater than the flows in. It'll be in stasis if the two are equal. You can get a lot of mileage out of just that. Um, but beyond that, um, we talk about systems having inertia. And again, that's a function of the stock and flow structure. We talk about all feedback loops involving at least one stock. Because you don't get feedback loops that are based on instantaneous relationships. It always involves changing some aspect of state to have a feedback loop. Um, and we can we can reason about that. And we can reason about some factors, flows can be changed more quickly. Some factors like socks change slowly. So this takes the level with causal loop diagrams, um, takes it down a, a, to a deeper level of engagement. And it may require, it typically will require several sessions, um, more time, but you can get a lot more out of it that's crisp, that, that's of significance for the model. And that forms a jumping off point for subsequent um, slot and flow. Now, um, so that's a, a sort of second way. Um, and you could argue that these quantitative analyses of keystone variables and variables with high betweenness centrality with just tons of interconnections run through that variable that they're like they're the gateway you know gateway between these variables you can you can apply those to this too a third way is a way that some of my colleagues particularly university of albany school is um is particularly strong in this regard. Uh, George Richardson in past years, now David Anderson and, and several others uh, there, they, they do work with, um, when they're together with participant groups in, in group model building, they will actually build up a quantitative stock flow model. Um, they will actually put in place equations for them. But as you can imagine, these are very simple stock flow models. So like two stocks, right? Um, and they'll reason about the backlog of remand in terms of these two stocks or in um, availability of legal aid services um, based on uh, the availability of these stocks uh, or based on the levels of these stocks. And they actually engage with parties around group model building in a quantitative source and they will run that with people in that session or in those several sessions and get feedback on the dynamics that's implied and say, is this consistent with your, with your understanding? So that's a deeper level which tries to bridge that divide, but it's limited to very constrained models, as you can appreciate. You're not going to build a very sophisticated model together at the same time you're in this group, you know, group setting. Um, that you'll not, you won't be able to make use of everyone's time in a, in a good way. Um, now, you may be excused for asking, well, wait a minute, is that an age-based model boot camp? Like, where's the age-based model? Oh, if, if you think these methods aren't applied, applicable to age-based modeling, 
um, think again, because uh, variants of these can be applied, are applied, and have been applied by us in the age-based modeling context. But generally, you want some adaptation, okay? Um, you, you want you want to think about causal diagrams that can be articulated for different types of agents, and that might relate agent-related factors and, and somewhat in a separate context interlinked, yes, but somewhat distinct, held visually distinct from contexts that are more about the environment, et cetera. And so there are variants of these that can be put into place for agent-based modeling. And we, in past years, uh, have put in place tools to help you know, do participatory modeling with agent-based models. And I think it's a fruitful exercise. But the fundamental Zhu Xiao, fundamental tension that you're talking about is a real one. And in, in my view, all of these are um, only partial solutions to it. Um, in my view, you know, a key part of it is also setting expectations on the part of the group. I know some people use causal diagrams predominantly bring people together to, you know, to, to, to get people in the same room who don't otherwise talk to each other, um, get them on the same page, pool knowledge, um, um, come to a common understanding, or at least better appreciate what, where each of them is situated in the challenges they have in the system. When you have these sprawling systems, never more so than on a cross-sectoral basis, you know, justice, education, social services, policing, corrections, um, health sciences, it's very easy to have misunderstandings. It's very easy to fall into old tropes, to fall into cherished prejudices about the other parties. Um, and uh, to think all police just want to lock people up, to think that, you know, that um, the folks who run the harm reduction centers, um, you know, are naive or what have you. And, and the fact is bringing people together matters. Bringing people together often leads people to appreciate why they cannot simply blame others in the now in the room for, for the problems they're having. They, they realize that their futures are intrinsically tightly bound. And this may sound like, you know, um, getting together and sing, singing Kumbaya, but it's not. It's, it's something more. It's, it's actually something that, that I've observed, and there's something substantial there. Psychologically, sociologically, in terms of exchange of information, in terms of exchange of understanding. It is very easy for people to blame other parts of a system if they're not thinking about how the system behaves in terms of its structure. Once you actually have a depiction of how the system behaves, you realize like these problems that I think of just being foisted upon me are resulting from dysfunction in this area of the system, which I always thought was a problem with them, but it's actually coming about because of this common problem in funding or this issue with discoordination with, with uh, a certain way things are handled. And you start to move towards solutions. Um, you start to lead to less, you know, finger pointing and blaming and more thinking about, okay, how can we get a win-win or at least work to resolve these systemic difficulties. If you don't have people in the same room, it's all too easy to fall into, you know, let ignorance lead you to the to the um, willful credulity and to believing like that this problem I'm encountering is someone else obvious is obviously someone else's fault who's not doing their job. And you find their job is almost impossible given the constraints they have because of these things. And you start to think about solutions. Um, let me give you one example. Um, many years ago, I, I ran a company doing um, uh, dynamic modeling consultations. And one of our clients was a university, um, uh, a, a university system that um, was spending um, a great deal of its political energy trying to argue um, for more resources from, this is in the US, from the state legislatures involved. Um, and they um, they uh, felt that um, they weren't uh, 
weren't getting enough of the pie, that the K through 12 system was overfunded and they were underfunded. And, and they felt that given, um, you know, given um, their responsibilities, they had, you know, a, a huge amount of, um, of funding needs for building maintenance, for, uh, for their programming, their classrooms, et cetera. And it was being met, um, these needs. And they felt that others were getting the bigger share of the pie from the state legislator, and it was leaving them starving and underserving their students. So they they spent years and years butting heads with the K through twelve system, saying they're getting too much, we need more. Um, and the K through twelve system didn't take that lightly, as you can imagine. They viewed this university system as trying to hone in on their part of the money, right? Their slice of the pie. Um, but we built models for the joint K through 12 and university system together, okay? And got both groups in the room. And one of the things that was learned, this, these actually work sometimes. Um, sometimes you go, you build the model qual qualitatively, and then you go build it off and you re-engage with the same stakeholders and and you know discuss what is learned and and get their feedback, get their critiques, refine the model more, et cetera. In any case, we got them together um, uh, to discuss this model. And and one of the big ahas there was for the university system. They realized that actually a great deal of the cost that they were being born could be traced directly or indirectly to problems in the K through 12 system, um, uh, they, they had to engage in a lot of remedial education courses. You know, the students coming into the university system did not have the backing at the, at the high school level that they needed uh, academically, and they were having to pick up the bag at the university, having to put in place the classes. And by engaging with the K through 12 system folks, they realized that actually these problems, it wasn't neglect, it wasn't laziness, it wasn't ignorance, it wasn't you know, bad decisions on the part of the K to 12. They were, the K to 12 was being starved of the funding they needed to make the requisite changes. So they ended up going, instead of being at loggerheads and arguing each that the other's getting too big a share of the pie and arguing their share of the pie should be bigger yet and the other one should be smaller. They went jointly to the state legislator and argued for more money for education as a whole, as a system, right? Thinking about these, these joint issues, our futures, they realized, are tied up with theirs. And the things that help them help us, actually. It's not a matter of, I need more of their choice of pie. It's um, both of us need to be resourced at the level that will make the system work. And that requires getting money to them as well as to me. And so that's the sort of that's the sort of thing that can come by bringing people together. And when you have that was a quantitative model, but it allows for that dialogue to take place. And often you start with a causal loop diagram, you build up part of it. People can be somewhat forgiving that you're only getting part of it, and you can use the causal loop diagramming or the system structure diagramming to elicit agreement as to like where you might start, what areas of the system they think might be most important, start work there, go back to them, and you'll often get a quite good reception. There, I'm not going to deny the tension, though. Yes, you'd like to look at these other issues, but often, you know, those end up falling outside the scopes realistically of the models that are built up. Sometimes that requires new science to be done, new understanding, new theory to be built for some things. And, you know, I think if you can set expectations, if you can bring to bear, um, you know, uh, a sense of let's be pragmatic, let's not boil the ocean one step at a time, let's build up um, understanding, and we'll work in the areas that the group flags as particularly high importance areas. You can go pretty far with it without people getting really frustrated, but setting expectations is a lot of the name of the game. I hope that's helpful, Jun Chiao, from my experience.
Okay. So um, message here before we finish up for this and we'll have a break. Any 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 other points of discussion there? We're 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 positioned to understand health economics models with this background much better and hybrid models more generally. So if we're okay, any any questions? Okay. So let's take a uh 10 minute break and we'll be back. The food is out and ready for your, for your use. Thanks. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> 